What we're going to go through right now is pretty much a big overview of what LEAD is all about, how it's going to help you in your careers, why it exists even, what's its purpose, why is it so big today. Uh, I wanted to thank Mitch at Ashray in New Mexico for putting this together. I'm glad you got all joined me. And if you have any questions at all, feel free to use the chat and then we can chat about them uh, at the end of the session. Or you can always email me, info at leadinggreen.com is the best way to reach me. Now, I should probably tell you a little bit about who I am. Uh, my name is Laura Melodic. I went to the University of Toronto in uh, about 10 years ago. I graduated in, in civil engineering where I focused on building science. Uh, one thing I really like about LEAD and sustainability is how multidisciplinary it is. So in my courses, I have people from architecture backgrounds, landscape architects, urban planners, engineers from mechanical, civil, electrical, industrial, architectural, and there's a lot of urban planners, environmental scientists, interior designers, and construction professionals, and even the real estate side. So it's a really wide ranging uh, sustainability field. and Parts of LEED that you didn't even think came into play when we talked about sustainable construction make a big part of it, which is pretty nice. And through it, a lot of people get exposed to a part of LEED that they never even knew existed, a part of this big building industry, and maybe find your passion and pursue it in that direction. Uh, a bit about how I got to where, where I am today. After my freshman year, I worked at this engineering firm called Morris and Hirschfield, and they were building our service centers along our highways uh, in Ontario, and they were all going for lead silver, which as a 19-year-old back then, I had no idea what that meant. But working on these projects, I saw it was a way to define a green building. And I thought that was kind of neat and actually missing in the industry. I thought we needed something to define what makes a green building actually more sustainable than the next. You know, people were just building a building. It was using a ton of energy, leak even more, and they painted it green and they claimed we have a green building. And that's called greenwashing. And that's one of the major things LEED is trying to combat. We want a definition that the public can trust that we know it's going to be a sustainable building. And I thought that was cool. I thought that was needed. And then I saw you could get accredited yourself by taking a couple uh, exams, which I thought was a great way to get ahead. And so I started studying for them and then saw back then you needed to have actual lead experience on a real life project uh, to be able to take the exam. So honestly, I was in a very lucky place and I had a very luxurious task on all those projects. I single handedly designed all of their RV way stations, which if you know what that is, it's like a hole in the ground if you have a big RV to dump its waste out gross, but uh, that was my claim to fame. And after I, I took the exams, I went back to university I, in my sophomore year, and no one knew what LEAD was back then, unfortunately, not even my professor, so no bragging rights. But, you know, I was telling my friends about it, and they said, this is where the field's going. How can we get involved? Unfortunately, there was a big cost barrier to getting involved in LEAD and sustainability, and a lot of the courses and materials were like a thousand bucks and weeks long. So I just started tutoring some friends and eventually there's enough demand to host workshops. And for the last 10 years, I travel to about 80, 90 universities each year around North America and, and some overseas. Uh, and one day at a time, I, I host a lead green associate and lead AP workshops. A little different this year with uh, my travel being quite restricted, understandably. And luckily, the internet has existed and I'm hosting webinars like this and, and, and it's been Quite successful so far. People are still showing up. They're still interested in lead and sustainability. It's not going anywhere. And so it's good to get involved now um, or just at least be aware of it, which I'm sure most of you have heard about lead before. Um, so that's my main gig. And so far, I've taught about 10,000 uh, participants, uh, professionals and students who have then taken the exam and passed on their first try. And my workshop is pretty much a five hour webinar, a textbook I wrote, and then my four practice exam, which is the recipe to success. I've also worked as a lead consultant and still do, um, just meaning I help owners and developers certify their projects. I'm kind of a middleman between all the different stakeholders from the design construction owner and, and try to really curate the best lead building that meets everybody's goals and needs. And so that's a little bit about me, it's enough about me actually. And when we talk LEAD, we should probably say, what does it even stand for? It stands for something called Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. It's about 20 years old. 
Um, one thing I really like that lead does is piggybacking off of existing, working, but underused standards. So when you really get into it, you'll see that a lot of these ideas are not new. They're just placed in a very organized and logical manner. And instead of making up their own standards, lead adapts and, and picks and chooses standards that already exist, like ASHRAE. We're going to talk a lot about ASHRAE standards. They don't want to reinvent the wheel. ASHRAE has figured it out. They, they're they're, they're expert, experts on, on energy and a lot of other things. So why not use them? And I'll, I'll show you how lead does that. One thing I like about lead is it's legitimate. It's created by us. So it's not asking us the craziest amounts to do but it's still much better than our building code is today. So it's realistic, it's achievable, and it's a lot better than our code. When you make the commitment to go green or lead, it happens right off the bat, which is good, because normally people don't think about how their design decisions affect the overall sustainability of their building. And we make sure you think about it in lead. And most importantly, it's marketable. They have spent a lot of money over the years marketing lead to the public. Frankly, if nobody knew what it was, who would care? But the public, we get it, we know what it means, and we're demanding it more and more from our buildings. I just wanted to take a step back when I was like this fun exercise of looking at how we used to build, because frankly, buildings are not new. We've been building buildings for thousands and thousands of years. Only recently did we start relying on all of our fancy energy consuming devices, which are convenient, but we lived without them for many, many years. And so here's a couple of neat buildings that really work with nature and use no uh, none of these technologies that we depend on today. And this Pantheon, a massive structure, and a few neat features that we have here. This Oculus at the top is actually the only source of daylight, which lights up the entire concave uh, ceiling and, and provides it everywhere. There's also an intricate system that takes all the water that falls through the oculus and actually reuses a part of it, as well as very well insulated walls. Uh, this is just an example of a very old time passive solar using the cliff to shade the unwanted high summer sun's heat, but give me free solar heat gain for low angled winter sun free heating. Why not use that today? A wigwam, literally building with nature. You are using just the items around you to work with it and same with an igloo. So very, very low invasive projects there. And here are just the modern day of passive heating, passive cooling. We know that the north side is always the cold side of the building. You're gonna duct your cold air through the north side and out the hot south. Same overhangs that the cliff's purpose was, blocking the summer sun's heat, giving me free solar heat gain. You know, don't have too much western facing windows because sun sets in the west usually. We get too hot, and even in Canada where I'm at, we turn on air conditioners in the dead of January because of these passive design flaws. So thinking about the building's orientation and using these items that consume little or no energy should really be more uh, used in our built environment. And a little bit of history. We know I'm not going to get into all the details of carbon. Right now, we're at the highest level of carbon levels ever seen. Unprecedented. What, is, what do we know those greenhouse gases do? They trap in extra heat from get, escaping out of our atmosphere, leading into a warmer air temperature. Not only does our air warm, but so do our water is warm. Warmer waters are breeding grounds for vicious hurricanes, and we constantly see their frequency increase more and more and more. Now, drought. That is also another item that does happen through our <clears throat> excuse me, through our warming, uh, our warming temperatures on the planet. 30% of our agricultural surface is at risk, and we're seeing those adverse effects more and more. And we're looking at air pollution increasing, increasing, increasing. So these are some of the items that we need to deal with today. Now, one way that I like to kind of present this, as uh, there's a lot of naysayers to climate change. And for those naysayers, I say, fine, don't believe in climate change, that's fine. But if you look at the earth, it's made up of a bunch of resources. The earth has been, we've been fortunate enough that the earth has shared our resource, their resources with us. However, they're not unlimited. They're all finite. So whether climate change is happening, which it is, 
or people don't believe it, just frame the argument like this. You're going to run out of these fuels that we need to power our economy and our lifestyle. And as we continue to consume it at a higher, higher rate and the supply gets lower and the demand increases, simply we won't be able to afford them eventually. It's just a short-sighted way to live. Our consumption rate is simply too high. And that's where we should focus our argument. Lower, using less to do the same amount. That is the way to go. And then there's this word called sustainability. It is the buzzword of the 21st century. Every company claims to be sustainable these days. It's all over their websites. And one way that I like to think of this term is not just, you know, saving enough resources for the next generation, but the fact that we don't inherit the earth from our ancestors, but we borrow it from our children. I always think that's a nice way to, to think about sustainability as a concept. Now, looking at buildings, where I'm from, heating is by far the largest consumer. Almost half of our energy load in buildings is due to heating. Then there's cooling, lighting, plug loads making up the rest of it. I like to think about these comparable buildings, back to what we talked about earlier, a building from over 160 years ago, 150 years ago. Why is this building more efficient than our modern structure today? And it's simple. It's the facade. I told you I'm a building science guy. We're looking at this R4. That's how good of an insulator the structure is overall. But no matter what, unfortunately, we're in a glass-obsessed society today where we build glass boxes, floor-to-ceiling windows, wall-to-wall, -wall, and it's crazy. Glass is the absolute worst insulator we could use. Even the triple glazed doesn't come close to a basic walls insulating property. And why do we do that? Well, a few reasons. Architects love it because it gives us these wide, pretty panoramic views, which even our feet need to see every day, all day for some reason. But the real reason is glass is the cheapest material. It's light, it's cheap, and it's easier to throw up a curtain wall of glass. But as an insulator, it's a good time to have a strong window to wall ratio and know where your daylight is coming in from. This one's a little harder to tell the difference, which more sustainable. And the only difference you'll probably notice is the use type. Here we have a commercial office structure. Here we have a residential building. And the only difference is our balconies on the facade, which act as a wonderful thermal bridge. Unfortunately, this continuous concrete slab just absorbs the heat or cold air and drags it right out, dumps it in the balcony, and increases your energy loads. So something that we should honestly break that continuous uh, that continuous slab, if possible, to avoid that thermal bridge from occurring. Back to LEED and why it exists and what it's all about. It's a point-based rating system. So depending on the amount of points your building achieves, you get a certain level of certification. And the first level is LEED certified at 40 points, silver is 50, 60 is gold, platinum is, platinum is 80 plus points. There's 110 total points that you can get your, that you can achieve to on your route to having a LEED certified building. And where those points lie is there's a number of categories. In those categories, there are mandatory items called prerequisites. You got to do all those. Optional credits, that's where you pick and choose. And depending on how many credits determine your points and the level of award that your building receives. This right here is a big lead scorecard or a little lead scorecard, and it's a simple list of all of our credits that I usually use with the owner. And I say, hey, what are we going for? OK, yep, yep. Fifty five points. Tell the team we're going for lead silver. It's always good to have a goal right off the bat, which is what I use a scorecard for as a lead consultant. Here are where all the categories and points lie. As you can see, different categories have different amounts of points. Uh, and in my workshops, I go into detail about each of the credits, and I don't have the time here today, so I'm just going to give an overview of each of them. Uh, we have prerequisites in most of these categories, which I mentioned are not worth points. And the reason why they exist is here, water's cheap. And if I'm building a building, I might say, eh, who cares about the water efficiency of the building? I'm going to focus elsewhere. I'm going to focus on energy. That's where I'm really going to save my money. You can't do that, though. In LEED, the prerequisites make sure that, say, they say, first off, you have to be 40% more uh, water efficient or 20% more water efficient and 5% more energy efficient. 
you have to do that. 5% versus ASH rate 90.1, for example. That's not worth any points. That's just allowing you to enter the point phase. So you have to meet all the prerequisites before even pursuing credits and lead. And that establishes a minimum level of sustainability throughout all aspects of the building. Now, really why has lead been so successful over the years? They've done a great job showing developers and owners that going green doesn't have to mean cash money green. In fact, there's a lot of time where a lead building doesn't cost anything more than a conventionally code built building. But depending on where you are and how stringent your code is, the gap can, can increase. The lower the code requirements, the more you seemingly have to do to become LEED certified. But generally, what I see as a construction and design premium on a LEED project is only about one to 3%, which yeah, it doesn't seem like that much, but on a $100 million project, one to 3 million bucks is still something to most people. So why bother with lead if it costs more? We're seeing a constantly high return on our investment proven throughout the years. And there's two different ways. The indirect way is marketability. Look, a lot of companies I know, a lot of universities I go to are only building lead certified buildings from now on. Why? Strengthen their corporate social responsibility program. Maybe you're gonna come do business with me now or come to university here now, simply because our environmental values align. It makes us more marketable. But the real tangible evidence is our savings over time in the operations of that building. And this chart really simplifies it. But essentially, look, a red building just built a code, has the lowest initial cost. Over time, we're using more energy, more water, more maintenance. It's not the best built building. A green building, yeah, costs a little more up front. But over time, less vulnerable to the fluctuations of energy and water prices, simply because you're using less of it. And maybe you even have renewables on site, you could sell excess electricity back to the grid. If you haven't seen this pretty picture before, we call it the triple bottom line or the three P's. It's kind of the basis of sustainability and lead in general. Uh, the earth is divided into these three large spheres, the profit economy, the people society, and the planet environment. And what we're trying to do is really satisfy all the wants and needs in each of those spheres. And most of the lead credits always tie back into one or more of these spheres. So it's a good thing to think about when we go and approach a lead building. And that profit side is what we just touched on with a high return on our investment. And looking at the people side next, we're the ones in these buildings all day, every day. And we're demanding green buildings more and more because they're healthier, people are more comfortable, productive, and, and happier. And frankly, if the market's demanding lead buildings and companies are not meeting that demand by building them, those companies are not going to be doing too hot going forward. And we're really seeing that shift take place today. You know, a generational shift. You look at grade school curriculums today, they all have a component of sustainability. Earth Day, Earth Hour. Who even knew about those 40 years ago? Now they're totally embedded in our culture. And it's a brand new job market. We've had the blue collar workers forever, white collar workers. And now it's this green collar industry. Unfortunately, I'm not wearing it today. But the green collar industry, it's here to stay. It's good to get involved in today. At least your foot in the door because it's only getting bigger and more demand and necessity in our built environment. And after all, this is our future. So we should probably not mess things up too much. Uh, and here are some cute babies there. And that is the people side of the trouble bottom line. And the planet side, we'll talk about it, but we mentioned it. However, the easiest way to look at it, there's only one Earth, folks. Let's not destroy it. Let's preserve it for at least one or two more generations, I hope, by reversing things like greenhouse gas emissions resulting in climate change. And we'll start to see that through LEED. Now, sometimes, depending on where you are, there's incentives to ease the financial constraints of going green. And a few examples of ones that I've seen around, a structural incentive. Maybe if you build a green building in Albuquerque, I'll let you build the extra floor you're normally not zoned for. Why? Your building is going to be using less energy and less water, and that's less low to my infrastructure. And I want that as a city. And now you might be saying, wait, you can build and sell an extra floor I never even thought you were allowed to, you could potentially recoup your extra cost right there. Some financially driven ones, common where I'm from, we have the Toronto Green Standard, and many cities have 
sometimes had them, sometimes didn't. Boston, New York City, they had extra codes. If you wanted to build in their city specific, you have to meet the statewide code, but also their city code. And for example, in Toronto, we have that. And you have to reach tier one. But if you go to tier two, you get 25% of your permitting fees back, which is like hundreds of thousands of dollars on a product I worked on. And building to that high quality already, you're above a LEED certified building. So it makes it even easier to go for LEED, as I mentioned, when the code is stringent. And some non-financial uh, incentives, maybe if you build a green building in your city, we'll put you on the city's website as the greenest building in town to show up. But you should know LEED is not alone. There's a lot of green building rating systems around the world. There's BRAM in the UK, ENEV in Germany, BBSA in France, Green Star in South Africa and Australia. We have another one here called the Living Building Challenge, which is really difficult. It's awesome. It's real sustainability. It's a net zero energy, net zero water. You treat all of your own wastewater on site. It's like true sustainability. Uh, I was just in Atlanta. They have this Kandata building at Georgia Tech, which for the last two summers, it's the living building. They didn't need to touch their mechanical HVAC system in Atlanta. It's passively cool. It was really, really neat to see that in action. The reason why LEED is the most popular by far globally is because it's internationally consistent. A LEED building is the same everywhere, but regardless of the city, state, province, country. And multinational companies like to keep their building programs consistent on a global basis. Also, it's realistic, as I mentioned. It's not asking us the craziest amount, but it's still much better than our building codes. And when we talk about LEED, there's two sides to it. So the plaques you've probably seen on a wall, we talk about those buildings as becoming LEED certified. People, though, you and I, we are getting accredited. So buildings get certified, people get accredited, and the first level of accreditation, which you have to pursue on the path to becoming a sustainable professional is the Green Associate. Uh, it's a pretty unique designation. It's a great way to get in the foot of, your foot in the door. It's a letters after your name once you pass it. And a lot of people just come and take it because they want to pad the resume. But trust me, it's a lot more interesting than that. I promise. I teach it. And uh, look, it's not even just engineers and architects. Sure, that's the main, those are the main fields of actual people who work on buildings, mainly because if you look at how many owners, developers are asking for their buildings to be LEED certified, companies are wanting to be able to bid on them and say, look, all of my staff, 90% of my staff are LEED accredited. At least they have a LEED green associate. We have an idea of what we're doing. Making your bid a lot more attractive. And having this under your belt makes you a lot more of an attractive hire as well, or prime for a raise. Now, I also teach like real estate analysts. They want to know where their money is going when they're investing in a lead building. So it's a really wide array. There are no prerequisites to the Green Associate. It's a two hour exam, 100 multiple choice questions. And the fee is $250 or $200 if you're working for a USGBC member company or $100 if you are a full time student. So the Green Associates level one, and it's a mandatory prerequisite to level two, the AP. And I'm sure you've probably seen this title after people's names, the accredited professional. Now there are five specialties in it. The first one is BDMC, Building Design and Construction, which is for new buildings and the most popular by far. And then O&M, Operations and Maintenance, is for existing building retrofits. And those are personally my two specialties are the two that are most in demand. Um, and we'll talk about the rest, but IDNC is interior design and construction, homes, and neighborhood development. Those are the five rating systems of lead. Each of them has an AP. And if you're going to be working directly with a lead building, you'll eventually need the AP. It's much more detailed than the Green Associate. Most of you will just start off with the Green Associate. And the fellow is like an honorary designation. If you've done something special, you could get nominated for that. Who made this thing up? Who actually created LEED? It's the United States Green Building Council. And there's UFCBC chapters in every state. Many have more than one state. I encourage you to reach out if you haven't to, to your state's USGBC chapter. Uh, personally, I'm a USGBC faculty member, which just means I've been approved uh, in my materials to, to teach and train different professionals. Uh, so they created LEED, as I mentioned, about 20 years ago. 
And they're the ones continuously updating the rating system, which is how we actually rate what makes a green building green. They also produce our reference guides, 800 wonderful pages, the Bible of LEED telling you exactly one step at a time how to build a LEED building. And then there's this tool called LEED Online, which I stare at a lot. And it's kind of the tool to bring everything together. I chase down the owner. I say, I need your drawing. I need your signature for credit one. Architect, your drawing for two. Engineers, your calculations for three. Contractor, your picture for four. And LEED Online is our tool to submit all of the design and construction documents to prove that we built it to meet LEED standards. Then somebody's got to review them. And that's the Green Business Certification Inc. They're the reviewers of it all. They go through what we created, what we built, and make sure it was built up to standard. They also create the exam and decide what to test us on. So the way I like to remember these, the USGBC are like the creators of LEED and the GBCI are the enforcers of it. Now, pretty much every country today has their own Green Building Council. I know in Canada, we have our own. And however, LEED is internationally consistent, as I mentioned. So it's the same version of LEED used no matter where you're at. And most of the time it goes through the GBCI to review. Now in a big picture, one thing that's for sure on our planet is our population is rising pretty quickly. The only thing going up faster is our demand for energy globally. Crazy increases. It's good that more people are gaining access to energy. That's great. But how are we ever gonna possibly keep up? It's such a rapid rise in demand. There's only two things we can do. We're either going to focus on where we create the energy or where we use it. But break it down like this. For every one new kilowatt hour of energy our planet, our people need, it's three to 100 times more expensive to create it, whether it's nuclear, coal, renewables, it doesn't matter how. Rather than saying, hey, where do we use that one kilowatt hour of energy today and reduce our consumption? I'm saying it's way, way cheaper to reduce where we consume than it is to build up new capacity that never existed at all. So if financially it makes sense to reduce consumption, let's start there. And let's start with the biggest consumers, which are beautiful buildings, up to 30% of our water, 50% of our energy, 72% of our electricity are consumed by buildings. They're also responsible for almost 40% of our carbon dioxide emissions. So it financially makes sense to reduce consumption first. Let's start with the biggest buildings. And that's what LEED's focus is on, really reducing buildings impact on the people and the planet itself through using tools like life cycle assessment and ASHRAE standards. And I'll show you in, in some of my courses how LEED incorporates these really good tools into itself instead of reinventing the wheel. This is a loose basis of what is important in LEED and deciding if one credit should be worth 10 points versus a credit only being worth one point. We're hoping that the credits reverse our contribution to climate change, enhance our human health and well-being, protect our water, biodiversity, our other resources, a general greener economy, and enhance social equity. And so all of the LEED credits also tie back into these seven categories or one of them, and that's how they valued which credits are gonna be worth how many points. The process to actually getting a building lead certified in a very uh, shortened version, you register your project, which just has a flat fee, and anybody can do it, you or me, it's usually the lead consultant who becomes the project administrator who registers the project. And I told you I control that lead online where I invite all the different stakeholders and I try to collect all the necessary documentation to then provide it to a GBCI and prove that we built it properly. And that's the scorecard I mentioned before. So the registration cost is flat. It's usually done by seeking out a sustainability consultant like myself. And if you haven't met them before, just Google it in your city. You are going to see a lot of results. There's a big demand for it. So there's a lot of people that do it. And then the actual certification fee is based on the square footage. So the larger square footage, the higher the price for certification, mainly because there's more that they have to review. 
So I mentioned a few items about the different rating systems, and one thing I really like Lead for doing is recognizing different buildings have totally different needs from a sustainable standpoint. So those five rating systems start with the BDNC, Building Design and Construction, which is the first one, and 90% of all Lead buildings to date are under BDNC because it's all for new buildings, which are easier because you have absolutely full control of them. Now within BDNC, there's different types of new buildings. There's new construction, which is just for general, commercial, and residential. Then there's adaptations or small variations for data centers, warehouses, hospitality, retail, healthcare, schools up to grade 12, and core and shell when you do not know who the tenants are going to be coming in to occupy the space. Now these are all very similar, but each of them has a few unique credits that just apply to their building type. And I mentioned the others about interior design and operations and maintenance. And all of them have, the categories have prerequisites, which are mandatory, and then credits, which are optional. And for example, the green associate focuses on the intent of each credit, the real reasoning behind why it's necessary, why it's going to be beneficial for the planet, people, profit. Whereas the AP, that really focuses on what the exact requirements are for us to do. That's the main difference between the Green Associate and the AP. And now I'm just going to do a quick brief over where the points lie. What are the categories? Now, the integrated design process, that's kind of an idea on its own, a big theme in sustainability, trying to get owners all contractors, subcontractors, general contractor, all engineers, architects, landscape architects, everybody around a table right at the beginning of the project to at least be able to talk about their individual goals and find synergies between them. For example, a synergy between an HVAC system and a really good wall. And maybe you don't need as efficient of an HVAC system if you have a very high R value wall. And finding synergies in, in, in that capacity to get the overall goal of the building as one. And so that's a big theme in the holistic design approach used in LEED. The next, and these boxes are kind of my naming convention, showing you what each credit is worth in which rating system, which is the fun of my courses, especially my AP class. And there's a few different items here. Location, we're looking at curbing sprawl. We want to build up and not out. We don't want to build in the middle of nowhere. We want to build where there is infrastructure and amenities. We want to build on previously developed site instead of a green field. And then transportation, four credits essentially trying to discourage people from driving a big gas guzzler to our building by making it easier to ride public transit, biking, green vehicles. That's our first location and transportation worth 16 points. Sustainable sites, that looks at what you're actually doing to the site itself. Are you hurting it? creating more green fields, more vegetation, managing rainwater, reducing the heat island effect, cooling off our, our heat island, and reducing light pollution. And that's the basis of sustainable sites. Then looking at water, all the same goal. Use less potable water in and around the building. Whether it's in your water flush and flow fixtures or your outdoor irrigation system or just metering water to make sure nothing goes wrong. That's what water efficiency is all about. Energy, the one you're probably waiting for. Looking at, this is a bit of an outdated uh, chart, but the, the, the premise remains. Canada, US, we are the best in the world. We use the most energy per person by far. So we're kind of the worst in the world. And the reason is simple. Fortunately, many people have access to energy here. And relative costs of energy are low. Relative, doesn't feel that way, but it is. It also gets super cold where I'm from, super hot where you're from. Extreme loads, cheap energy, and access equals this. And how you look at this and I look at this every day is what a time to be alive. This is the easiest time we could ever possibly improve because we're never going to be this bad again, probably. <laughs> so let's get started. And there's your Canadian optimistic view from, from here. So thank you. Oh, here's a big PV array I worked on before I started traveling, and now I look like this. Thank you. Um, energy is the most in-depth. It has 33 points available. There's a lot of effort that you need to do to even meet the prerequisites, which I'm going to talk about a few. 
but commissioning is a huge prerequisite and a credit. It's honestly a necessity now in 2020, if you're not commissioning a building and making sure everything's installed and maintained properly, you're way behind the curve in my opinion. Energy performance compared to a baseline, which is ASHRAE 90.1 that I'm gonna mention. Talk about energy metering, refrigerants, demand response programs, renewable on-site and off-site, and that's it for energy. Um, now, ASHRAE, we all know what that is, that we're all members here. The American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers, 10 times fast. And ASHRAE has a lot of standards that lead piggybacks off of. They say, why reinvent the wheel? These are updated, they work, let's piggyback. And ASHRAE even has their own pretty much green building rating system, 189.1, Standard for design for high performance green buildings for, for low and low rise, except for low rise buildings. And uh, I've read a bit into that. Obviously, I focus more on LEED and LEED, which focuses on specific ASHRAE standards like 90.1. And there's various ways to compare buildings to baselines. Now, the prescriptive path is usually used when the building can't be modeled itself. Uh, and there's a max of only about five points there. Whereas most of the time we model, uh, and so one of my one of my friends and colleagues is this gentleman Sam Mason. He actually lives in Albuquerque. Uh, he, he runs this company called Encompass Energy, and, and he's a full time energy model. This is all he does, uh, and, and energy auditing and consulting. But it's a huge business. There's cities like Toronto where now a preliminary energy model is mandatory if you want to get building permits. More and more cities and states and eventually nations are going to be doing energy benchmarking where you're pretty much taking your building, putting it in a class of similar buildings and seeing how you rank. And that's going to lead to say if you're in, and it's already doing this in New York City where de Blasio says, look, if you're in the worst 10 percent performing buildings and you don't improve by 2030, we're going to fine you. And it makes my job a lot easier because I can really make the financial case of going green really early on. Look, if you make these improvements now, you'll get yourself paid back in two, three years and then making money rather than taking the can down the road. So energy modeling and energy analysis is a huge part of LEED, a huge part of the industry today. And it's what we're going to talk about. This is a model that I did in eQuest. And there's a lot of software out there. There's IEF, there's Energy Plus, there's uh, Revit has Ecotech, Rhino has Diva, even Google SketchUp has a plugin. But this is generally the most popular one, eQuest. And pretty much you're getting a 5% prerequisite mandatory reduction against ASHRAE 90.1, all the way up to 54% for 19 points. A LEED certified building only needed 40 points. 90, you're halfway there if you max out this credit of beating ASHRAE 90.1 by 54%. And how this model works is I go into ASHRAE 90.1 and I build it imagining that I use the guts of that standard. This R value for the roof, wall, floor, U value for the window efficiency, lighting, boiling, heating, cooling system efficiencies as per the standard. I run the building, spits out my baseline case, and that is then the number I need to beat by five up to 54% reduction. And you can do that in multiple ways. It's up to you, it's your design. Just think about the, the room you're in and the limitless amounts of ways you could potentially design that room. It all affects the, affects the end load consumption. And once you work with all the stakeholders and the owner and try to optimize the building's energy, energy consumption while still maintaining, while still maintaining what everybody wants and their needs in the building, you plug in your design case, you run the building, and you see how much better you are than the ASHRAE 90.1 baseline. And that's how LEED uses ASHRAE in this capacity. That's energy, materials and resources. This one changed a lot in lead version four, which is what we're on today. Lead version four is today's current version. And this deals with pretty much how is all the materials made and what goes into them. So it's focused a lot on the manufacturer. It also focuses on where any construction debris is gonna go, how easy it's gonna be to recycle for the occupants of that building. Uh, and if there's ability to reuse elements from an older building, and that's materials and resources, it's a very complex category now. And indoor environmental quality, this one also piggybacks off a lot of um, a lot of uh, 
ASHRAE standards, which I'll, I'll show you in a moment, but it's looking at indoor air quality, which is t often t like 10 times hot, worse than the outdoors, and we, we need to address that. Uh, we're talking about acoustics, environmental tobacco smoke control, mainly most codes have that now in, in a lot of different cities. We want to have a high level of thermal comfort and control, interior lighting comfort and control. And I'll just show you a few of the ASHRAE standards that are used here. Here, ASHRAE 62.1, and usually we use the most updated years. This is just what uh, the lead exam uses, the 2010 version. So that's what I talk about in my, in my workshops. I do know they've been updated though. Um, and where it tells you based on your square footage and the amount of people in the building, this is the amount of fresh air cubic feet per, 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 per meter that you need to bring in. For. And same with natural ventilation, a minimum level of natural air to bring in if you're not mechanically ventilating fully. And then thermal comfort, our next ASHRAE standard, ASHRAE 55, which has been mandatory in a lot of codes, like in California under Title 24 for years. And this tells you that the combination of your HVAC efficiency and your walls insulation need to combine to be this efficient. And that's a huge factor and lead, and I think a great place to save a lot of energy. And those are the three big ASHRAE standards that lead uses, 90.1 for energy modeling, uh, 62.1 for our fresh air ventilation rates, and 55 for our actual thermal comfort. And this is the other half of the credit showing that you have enough control in each space of all of these different items. Then the next two categories are kind of the bonus categories that I like to talk about. Uh, in an innovation and design, you can actually make up your own credit and in innovative performance if it doesn't exist in the current rating system and is still good for the people, plan, and profit. Exactly performance is about going beyond an, an existing credit threshold. Creating and test testing a pilot credit. Somebody needs to test pilot credit to know if they're going to work in the next version. And then lastly, little, little old me, a lead AP is worth a point on the project. So you get a one bonus point for having a lead AP, a credit professional, uh, on the project. And regional priority is a really rel relatively newer category in the last 10 years. And it's important because a building in Toronto does not have the same priorities as a building in Utah, as a building in New Mexico, as a building in L.A. So each local USGBC chapter votes and they say, hey, based on where we're located, water is the most important, we're in a drought. So each water credit gets an extra point tacked onto it, encouraging people to go for those water credits because they're weighted a little heavier. Now, a few things to take away, everybody. Thank you for paying attention. Uh, there's a lot we can learn from our past. We saw that right at the beginning of the course or the, the, the session today. Buildings are not new. We've been building buildings for thousands of years. Let's take some of these passive techniques that we used before energy consumption and, and really incorporate them into our buildings. We could, we should, but we're not that great at it. Also, lead is not the answer to all the world's problems, unfortunately. However, it's a good start. And every few years, a new version comes out. So right now we're on version four, which really raised the bar. And as we continue to push the envelope, codes get pushed to higher and higher. And eventually, soon enough, I think it will be the answer to at least one or two big issues we face on our planet. Also, the values in lead just make sense. There's a lot of people that watch my class and say, why? Why is that worth a point? That's the most logical, sensible way to build a building. Why are you getting a point for that? Well, we love taking shortcuts in the design and construction industry, and through incentivizing us with points and lead, we're going to make sure we do it right the first time around. But everybody's got to work together to get that best building out of our investment. And what's next? If this wasn't terribly boring and semi-interesting to you, uh, or you are interested in pursuing your lead professional designations, uh, that's my focus. Um, normally, I said I'm on the road doing them in person. Now I'm doing in-house or in-house in webinars. So a lot of companies that have slowed down work a little bit and want to help their employees gain some professional development, uh, contract me and I, I, I come in via webinar, I'm sometimes in person, uh, and, and host 
in-house webinars. If there's 10 people interested, I'd be happy to do that for anybody here. Or if you are just interested yourself or I have a few colleagues, uh, I do open webinars. And for example, my next one is Saturday. Oh, it's Saturday. Uh, I knew that. It's Saturday, November 7th at, at 3 p.m. Uh, and then you can see my next six uh, lined up there. And I also am doing an AP, BD, and C webinar once you pass the Green Associate. I also have a lot of people do them together. So they do the AP, BD, and C and the Green Associate in one sitting just because there's a lot of overlapping. Um, my courses are $200 uh, for the Green Associate and $400 for the AP. Um, or $500 for both of them combined. And you can use a 25% discount by being an ASHRAE member and using the coupon code SUST, S-U-S-T for sustainability. And you are more than welcome to sign up on leadinggreen.com forward slash online for all of the details. Um, not only do I do live webinars, which are recorded and I do send recordings, but everybody's schedule is crazy this year and always honestly. So I do it on demand. So I have a recorded version of this. It's a similar course as me standing here, but it's a lot more entertaining and interesting. And it's about five hours long and you can pace yourself through it at your own time. Um, if there's any questions you have for me, I'm going to, uh, by all means, you can unmute your mic or you can just give me a call tomorrow. Uh, I'm happy to share any information or better yet, email me. This is my email, info at leadinggreen.com. Uh, for my friend Sam Mason in, in New Mexico, he is at Encompass Energy. That's his own company, uh, and he focuses on energy modeling and auditing uh, and some and some lead work as well. So, uh, who, wh whichever one you're interested, I'm focused on the training these days. Um, so, I hope that you might want to join one of my webinars. They're pretty informative, and it's a good thing to to knock out. And, and so far, everybody who I've taught and who has followed my study steps has passed on their first try, which is great. And if you follow my steps, you will too. And I just wanted to uh, thank everybody for, for coming today and giving me their, their lunch hour. Um, and thank you, Mitch, for inviting me. I'm, I'm glad that we got some more people from, from other chapters as well. All of this is recorded. I'm going to send it to, to Mitch and whoever else is interested. And I'll, I'll get that to you uh, in case you want to show any of your colleagues or friends an introduction to lead. And if you have any comments or, or, or feedback for me, I would be happy to hear it. Thanks, everybody.